in the book of Acts, we have just made transition from the first half of the book to the second. Quite often it is uh, humorously cited in classes that the name should not have been Acts of the Apostles, but it should have been the Acts of Peter and Paul. For the first half of the book centers primarily around the birth of the church through the leadership of that one who headed up the twelve, the Apostle Peter. But when we get to chapter 13, one of the great things that had occurred in the first half, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, now puts at the forefront God's major missionary and theological mind, the Apostle Paul. Next to Dr. Luke, Paul is the second largest contributor to the New Testament text. And we find him in his first missionary journey. He has been sent out because of a revival that broke out about the things of Christ in the city of Antioch. In fact, we were first called Christians. Where? You need to know that. We were first called Christian in Antioch. People saw what was done and what was said in and through the lives of those believers, and they basically said, they're like Jesus. Wouldn't it be great for people to know that you and I were Christian just because of how we talk and because of what we do? They were first called Christian in Antioch. And so this morning, we come to chapter 14, and they have moved to Iconium. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual. Now, I'm underlining that because that's where the title for today's message comes from. They went into the synagogues of the Jews as usual. This was their plan. Folks, this was God's plan. God had worked these preaching stations out in history over the past 700 years. And when the Spirit of God fell at Pentecost and the church began to send missionaries like Paul and Barnabas They went first to a place where people had an understanding of how God, through the millenniums, had acted out in the hearts and lives of men. They went to the synagogues. And there attached were not only Jews who had an understanding of the Old Testament text, but this unique group that really was the matrix of the birth of the early church. And that was a group called the God-fearers. They embraced the principles of Judaism, but they had not taken the full weight of being proselytized. Now, how many of you have heard that word? You're out there proselyting. How many of you have heard that? In fact, usually what we mean by that is you're stealing sheep or other church members to come to your church. Well, we've had people leave this church, and they went on a calling campaign. Calling all the folks in our church, trying to get them to come and join them in their church. We've even had some of that going on lately. You know, we've got a sister church down here. Uh, Man, it was a big thing. If you live here on the beach, it's come in from Woodstock, Georgia. And I got word this past week about three or four of our families that had received calls from families that used to be at our church that went to some other church and now went to that church and want our folks to come join them at Woodstock. Let me tell you, if God leads you there, go. If he doesn't, you better stay. Best place to be is where God puts you. Stay there until he tells you to do otherwise. You will be blessed for that. I don't know how that got into my sermon. It was just there. But they went as it was usual to the synagogues, and they spoke so effectively. Man, I tell you, this is the heart, it should be, the heart of every pastor that God would so anoint our preaching that it would be 
of such effect that large groups of people come to know Christ. But we, as a culture here in America, become hardened to the good news of the gospel. But they preached, and there was such effectiveness that a great number of the Jews and the Gentiles believed. But the Jews, who refused to believe, stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Now, I know y'all have never been anywhere where that occurred in a church, have you? When one group doesn't agree with another group, they try to get everybody else to agree with them, and quite often that's exactly what's going on. They get their minds poisoned to the biases and prejudices of the leveraging of the group that is against the other group, and it tears up the body of Christ. Is this a bad thing? Yes. Why? Because God's prayer for us is that we be one. That's why Jesus said, if you have an issue with somebody, go to them alone and tell them. Tell them with the intent of winning them back, not telling them with the intent to tell them off, which is kind of how we do it. Let me tell you where you're wrong. Instead, you know, what can we do to come together and make this right? And if you don't get other people on board, It's a whole lot easier to settle an issue. Have you noticed that when you reconcile with someone, it's a lot easier when there are very few people who know about it. It's just between you and that person. But if it doesn't work, get some folks who love you and the person that you're at odds with enough that they want you to reconcile don't go choose people who, and that's how we usually do it. We get at odds with somebody. We tell them we're torqued with them. Then we go get 15 or 16 people that we can convince that we're right to go with us to tell them just how wrong they are. I can tell you, folks, that doesn't work. But if you do it the way God said to do it, it usually works. Rarely does it go to the third stage where if there is disunity within the body that cannot be settled, then it becomes a matter for the church to act in discipline toward. We've had to do that numerous times in my 25 years here. Not a lot. I can count them on one hand. But in every case, the truth came to the surface by that point. In fact, we had one person come and... The deacon body finally said we need to approach that person and encourage them to change both what they're saying and what they're doing or ask them to leave the church. And that person left the church only to send a letter five years later and apologize because they knew the whole time that what they were doing was wrong. You see, there's a way that church ought to work. There's a way that relationships ought to work. But as soon as God begins getting your relationships and mine and those within the church working, (laughs) the old evil one has a way to make them fall apart or to at least resist their working. And so that's what you have. They're preaching with power. People are coming to Christ. And the folks who don't like it begin to speak against it. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time Boy, I tell you, that is an understatement. That is exactly what happens with most of the ministering that pastors have to do. We have to put out fires because people won't do things the way God wants them done. And so they they spent considerable time there, and they spoke boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were truly divided then. Some sided with the Jews and others with the apostles. You know, what we do when we disagree is we want to create a side. And what that in our language today means, we begin a church split. It's almost humorous when you drive into a town, most any town, especially in the 
Bible Belt or this southern area, you always have what? A first Baptist church. But it's always interesting that you have what? A second one and quite often a third one. (laughs) And now we've kind of uh, gotten behind the camouflage and we don't go one, two, and three. We give ourselves some kind of new name. And it's really interesting, isn't it, when you find out that the reason that the Second Baptist Church exists and they are apart from the First Baptist Church was because they had a big business meeting and they couldn't decide which side of the podium to put the piano. You think it's funny, but it's true. You would be surprised at the small things that the evil one uses to divide God's people. And never does it happen more powerfully than when God is moving in a way where lives are being transformed by the changing power of Christ. And they had that problem in Iconium. And so there was a definite split. There was a plot afoot. I like how that sounds. There was a plot afoot. That means that the side that was against Paul and Barnabas saw themselves as what? Losing. What happens to the side in the church in the midst of a split when they find out they're losing? They go underground. (laughs) And they create a plot. And uh, what occurs then is subterfuge. You know, it's not out in the open. It's done in meetings at the house and the coffee shop and the gas station and all these places. And subterfuge becomes the name of the game. And so they had a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews together with the leaders to mistreat them Now, they were serious. Somebody's planning to kill you. That's serious, isn't it? That's what stoning means. In fact, before we get to the end of this chapter, they do stone Paul. Now, here's the guy preaching God's word. Multitudes of people are coming to Christ. Miraculous signs are being done. People's lives are being changed. And those who are against it, do their best to kill it. When was the last time you looked at Calvary? Because, friend, that's exactly what your sin and mine did to God's redemptive love for us. And we're no different than that plot that's afoot. But they found out about it, that is Paul and Barnabas, and they fled to Lyconium, the cities of Lister and Derby, and to the surrounding counties where they continued to preach the good news. Now in Lister, there said a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth. That's significant. It's not an accident. It's not something that occurred. He was born that way. A lot of things believed about people born with deformities in the first century, not the least of which was it was either that person's sin or the sin of that person's parents. So here's a person born crippled with bad feet had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and and began to walk. I I believe we had a little bit of that going on in the church house. It changed some people's attitudes. Why doesn't it? Because there's not enough of that kind of faith. I'm not telling you that you're healed 
based on your faith, but I'm telling you it definitely takes faith to be healed. When the crowd saw that Paul had done this, they shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form, and Barnabas they called Zeus. Now that was because he looked better than Paul. <laughs> you know, Paul's got some deformities. He's had eye issues. we fairly uh, certain that he did from the time of his conversion experience when the scales fell from his eyes. Uh, Paul just wasn't much to look at or to listen to. But he seemed to be one talking the most. That's why they called him Hermes. If you know anything about Greek mythology, he is the messenger God. He's the one always bringing the word. In fact, when you study Scripture and you get down to the very basics of what it says, that word is hermeneutics from the word Hermes or message or the messenger God. So, They called Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths, and they came to the city gates because because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifice to them. Now, thinking that they're sent directly from their pagan gods, they want to incorporate that. But notice, that is not the heart of Barnabas and Paul. For when they heard this, they tore their clothes. Uh, uh, That's a a sign of mourning, a sign of of deep, deep um, disfavor about what's going on. They tore their clothes, and they rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. And that's going to get you in trouble. When people want to put you on a pedestal and you say, hey, you know, there is no difference between me and you. All we have here that we are experiencing is what God's doing. Praise God, we can all be a part of it. But people like to put folks on pedestals. I learned early in my ministry to tear those down because it is no fun to fall off. That was supposed to be funny. I'm sorry if you missed that. We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news. There's that word again. Telling you the truth and trying to get you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that's in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without a testimony. In other words, if you go and read what he'll later tell you in the book of Romans, everything that God made does what? In a physical way, testify of what is invisible in the qualities of God. And so he says, yet he has not left himself without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops In their season, he provides you with plenty of food, and he fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. You know, when people get their mindset on what they want to do, it's hard to get them to change, even when what they're doing is wrong. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, How did the Jews at Antioch and Iconium feel about Paul and Barnabas? Well, I would think if they wanted to stone you, they probably didn't like you much. Right? So, they came and they won the crowd over and they stoned Paul. Now, folks, this was not an accident. It was intentional And they didn't go off and leave him without fully believing he was dead. Now, stoning is something that uh, we have kind of different ideas. I think most of us have more of the Arabic idea where they bury a person based on a male or a female, how deep they bury you. And they bury you basically up to your chest. And then then they wrap you up with with a cloth. 
So they can't see you and you can't see them. And they pelt you with rocks until they kill you. Or piles up so high that in the, meet, in the midst of the brutality, you su- suffocate. But that's not how the Jews did it. The Jews would take you up to a certain height, about 20 feet, tie your hands behind you, push you off on a hard surface. Fall 20 feet, hit the concrete or whatever with the hope that the lick would kill you. If it didn't, they would stretch you out arm and leg, put a huge boulder on your chest. They dropped it, by the way. And then everyone else would come and pile stones on top of you. That's what happened to Paul. He's been pushed off. He hit the ground with his hands tied behind him. They dropped a boulder on his chest and piled rocks on top of it. And they think, there, we're done with that. So they stoned him. Outside the city, they thought he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, well, we've got to read in between there, right? What happened? Are y'all with me today? What happened? Wait a minute, what happened? I think they had to take all those rocks off of him, don't you? <laughs> He wasn't getting up. So the first thing they did after everything was over, they thought he was dead. They went out there, and all these they started moving the rocks. They're looking desperately. Can you see them as they're going through the rocks? You know, Paul, are you okay? Are you still with us? You know, they're wondering, is he, is he alive? And they get down to the major rock, and they take that off of him. And miraculously, he gets up. I don't think he felt real well. They gathered around him, and he got up, and he went back into the city. And I can hear him. I can't believe it. Look at him. How could you go through that? Look at him. I mean, think about, make it come alive a little bit, folks. Don't be bored in the text. It can't tell you everything. The next day, he and Barnabas left. Absolutely. (laughs) I don't think he ran. (laughs) But they left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city, and they won large numbers of disciples. Do you think, possibly, one of the stories that Paul, the major speaker, told was, you know, I just was stoned and left for dead. But by the miraculous power of God, he spared my life so that I could share the good news of the gospel with you. Would that get your attention? I think he probably said something like that. And so, then they turned to Lister and Iconium and Antioch. They went back to where they had come from, strengthening the believers, of course, those who had come to Christ when they were there in their ministries, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Why? Because now folks who are following Christ are being persecuted. Encouraging them to remain true to the faith. He said, we must go through many hardships, folks, to enter the rule and the reign of God in our life. The Christian life is not easy. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders. Now, there's huge discussion and even governmental systems today about elders. But the word means overseer. And he's primarily appointing pastors to these home churches where believers have been converted as a result of their preaching. And that was for each of the churches or the house churches. And with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord. That is the same kind of thing we do when we lay on hands and we ordain. Committing them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. And after going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And they went and had preached the word in Perga. And then they went to Italia. 
And in Italia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that had now been completed. And on arriving there, they gathered the church together. Man, what a lot of stories got told. And I promise you, that stoning was one of them. And they gathered them together and they reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there for a long time with the disciples. This morning, planning for success. It's 9 o'clock. I am not going to have a successful delivery of this sermon. So let me give you the major point. This is how, from the text, we, as a church, you as individuals, can plan for success in ministry. First, if you're going to be successful, you've got to preach God's Word. You've got to proclaim it. It's there in verse 1. It was what they did every day, all the time. It was their plan to go and share God's Word. Now, let me tell you what I have found out in these 40 years of ministering that most folks in the church, when you say they went and they preached God's Word, they are clueless to what that actually means. It sounds like something spiritual and churchy, but if you sit down and you ask them, Well, most of the time they'll tell you, well, it's good news. But folks, the good news had six definite points. Reference back to chapter 1 real quick with me in the book of Acts, actually chapter 2. And just take a pen and dot these. First, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. That's our first thing that's about the good news. Paul I mean, Peter has stood up on the day of Pentecost to preach. Uh, The people that are a part of that first infilling or indwelling of the Spirit are believed to what? Be drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. And so there is an apology. If any of y'all have ever been in apologetics and you think you've learned something deep, that's just an argument (laughs) to prove that what you believe and what you're saying is right. And so he gave a defense. And the first thing he said is, remember what the Old Testament said. And in verse 16, he begins to quote the prophets. That's the first thing that you preach when you preach the good news. God keeps his word. He does exactly what he says he's going to do. The second thing, in the good news is a reporting that God did do exactly what he said he was going to do. He did it uniquely in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So in verses 22 through 24a, you have the second point of the preaching of the good news. That God not only keeps his word, but in history he has kept his word. The third thing that happens is over in verse 33. When Jesus rose and ascended after the post-resurrection appearances, he is exalted to the right hand of the Father. Why did he need to be exalted? Because Paul said he emptied himself of his divinity and took up our humanity. And now that he's finished his historical work that God had promised that he would do in and through the Christ, he is now placed back in that divine position. And he sits down because the work of redemption is finished. He's exalted to the right hand of God the Father. And then Jesus did, because Jesus is God, and he does what God does. What does God do? What did I tell you God did? What's the first point? He does exactly what he says he's going to do. And what did Jesus say he was going to do? If I go back to the Father, I'm going to pour the Holy Spirit out on the church. Well, they've already done that in the Pentecostal experience. That's the very thing that has given impetus to the preaching that Peter is now sharing that gives us this third and fourth point of the proclamation 
And then, once you've preached the good news and the truth of God's love, the Holy Spirit comes and starts doing what? Because he's poured out on the church, he starts doing his work. He convinces the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, what's going on there is he gets a hold of you on the other side of all of your excuse making and he gets you eyeball to eyeball with God and says, you're lost and you know you need God and you're separated and you long to be with him and here's your opportunity. Now, does it work? Absolutely. What did they ask? That's the next point. They were cut to the heart. That's conviction. What must we do? Do, believe, be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Then go to the end of verse 24. It's kind of stuck in there. It says, it is impossible for death to keep Christ. It's impossible for it to hold him. What I want to remind you of is that Jesus is coming again. And folks, all that is good that God has done, that brings us to right relationship with him, with ourselves, and with others, enables us to fulfill the great commandment, is going to be a point upon which each of us will stand before holy God and be accountable one day when he comes as king of kings and lord of lords. Now write down your outline. There's power in God's word. Certainly because what? It changes sinners like you and me into saints. Not instantaneously, but over a process. And while God is doing these good things, just like God was doing good things in Iconium, The evil one is going to stand against it. And so, let me tell you, if you're going to be successful, you need to know that when you begin to stand for God, there will be something afoot plotting against you. Always. When will you have rest from that? When you stand in the presence of Jesus. And not before. And then, the result is... It brings perfect peace. Isaiah, the prophet, listen to what he says. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast or stayed in you because he has trusted you. Perfect peace. Why? Listen to this. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, folks, aren't you glad we're not going to have any more sequesteries? We're not going to have any more governmental shutdown. We're not going to have to go through the loss of loved ones, the threat of the failure of relationships, or the agony of dealing with ones that have failed, with worrying about whether our kids are going to make it given the context of our world and the bad choices, at least when I speak of mine, that they've made. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer anything to make us afraid. The Jews were terrified of the sea. That's what he's talking about. There's no more sea. There's nothing else to be afraid of. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard the loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away all of their tears. He will make it so there is no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain. For when he comes, the older order of things will pass away. Folks, that ought to give us the sense of perfect peace that comes to us from God's word. It isn't over until he says it's over.
this morning. You want to live successfully? You want to see how the early church did it? Then you do these things. You faithfully proclaim God's word. You realize that there is power in that proclamation. Folks are going to plot against you when you proclaim the truth like that. But in the end, there is perfect peace, both now and forevermore for those who do it. All folks, let's be successful as a church and as individuals in the things of God. Stand with me.